There is no sound in this clip, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>
percent of the world was covered by water. Eighty percent of all people live near water. Ninety percent of all trade travels by water. Freedom at work, one hundred percent of the time. Howdy. Howdy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Roman Papaduke, and I'm the executive director of the George Bush Presidential Library Foundation. On behalf of President and Mrs. Bush, welcome to tonight's special program featuring Captain Brian Luther and members of his crew of CBN 77. We are indeed privileged to have the first public deployment briefing by the captain here at the Bush Library Center. As you all know, the carrier is named for our own President George Bush. A which is a tribute to his leadership in leading uh, in helping end the Cold War, in reuniting Europe, and of course, of bringing freedom to Kuwait. The President's presidency and, the C and CBN 77 indeed stand as a testament to the strength of our country in serving as a beacon and a bulwark for peace and freedom around the world. Thank you, Mr. President, for all your leadership. I have a few uh, quick announcements before I introduce the captain and his crew. Uh, for those of us who are joining uh, us via the internet, a special welcome to those viewers. We also have a number of special guests with us. Joining us is Rear Admiral Greg Nofel. Admiral. <laughs> also joining us is retired Rear Admiral and President of Texas A&M Galveston, Robert Smith. And of course, our very own, the Dean of the Bush School, Andy Cardin's lovely wife, Kathy. <laughs> and indeed, a very special welcome to all the Boy Scouts and the members of the Corps of Cadets. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, following the presentation by the uh, captain and his crew members, there will be uh, questions from the audience. Those of you who would like to pose questions to the captain or any members of his crew can do so by using the microphones that are pre-positioned uh, in the center aisles. Please make your questions very short and to the point since we'd like to get as many questioners in as possible. This time, it's my pleasure to introduce the captain. Captain Brian Luther graduated from Marquette University in 1984 with a degree in computer science. He was designated a naval aviator in March 1986. Seagoing assignments include USS, USS John F. Kennedy, USS Theodore Roosevelt, USS George Washington, and USS Enterprise. He served as executive officer on board USS Nimitz. He also served as commanding officer for USS Tarawa's final deployment, after which uh, she was awarded the Department of the Navy Safety Award. Captain Luther's Washington assignments include action officer and watch stander in the National Military Command Center during Operation Desert Storm, on the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations, the staff of the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and the staff of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He graduated from the Naval War College was the honor graduate in his MBA program at George Mason University in May 2004 and completed the Navy nuclear power training program in December 2005. Captain Luther's military awards and decorations include the Defense Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit, Bronze Star, Navy Achievement Medal, and various other unit and campaign awards. He has flown over 3,400 flight hours and has accumulated 825 carrier landings. Captain, thank you very much for your service to our country. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Brian Luther. Howdy, everyone. Howdy. When in Rome, right? So uh, sorry for the budget cuts. We couldn't afford sound for the whole movie, so we went with... 
figured if it worked for the artist, it would work for us. So, well, just the other night I was packing to come uh, here and uh, my wife was uh, wryly noting that once again I was departing and going to do something cool and, uh, and leaving me with our, her with our three destructor little sons. And so she said, hey, do you have your brief? And I said, sure. And I let her look at it and it listed on the... Um, on the front, a uh, little briefing admonishment we have in the Navy, but I was saying to her, it's going to be a very difficult brief because how do I take seven months in the lives of 5,000 people where we steamed 62,000 nautical miles, we had 101 days where airplanes flew off the ship into combat, we flew for 193 days, we had 30,000 flight hours, we had 10,000 traps, and we had seven different port calls with 28,000 sailor days ashore, all in 30 minutes. And on underneath the slide, it has, if you can't be brilliant, be brief. And, and she looked at me and she said, well, I know you, honey, they'll be happy with brief. <laughs> so I, I fall back on a marine corollary to briefing, and if you can't bring, be brief, bring reinforcements. So I'd like to make some introductions, if I could. Uh, starting here closest to me is Commander Derek Lavin. He is my reactor officer. Uh, so he is responsible for the two nuclear reactors on board the George H.W. Bush, which generate all the steam uh, that which we use for propulsion and for generating electricity and making uh, the water that we use every day, 400,000 gallons. Uh, he is a graduate of Tufts uh, University, and he has a, a master's from the Navy War College in National Security Affairs. Next to him is my air boss, Commander Will Powers. Uh, he runs <laughs> He runs the airport. He is from the University of Arizona and then got an MBA in Colorado uh, State University. Next to him is my senior medical officer, Commander Kim Toon. <laughs> she is the fifth uh, female senior uh, medical officer on board a carrier. She went to FSU for her undergraduate Flo University of Florida, so she's somewhat conflicted for medical school and then she went to Tulane for her master's in public health. Next to her is Lieutenant Commander Hank Fitch. <laughs> He's my first uh, very salty, grizzled uh, officer. He's responsible for all the ship handling activities. So when we pull into port, when we exit port, when we weigh anchor, drop anchor, when we replenish at sea, it's his sailors that do all that work. Uh, next to him is uh, Command Master Chief Dave Colton. Uh, Command Master Chief is part of the leadership triad. There's uh, myself, the executive officer, and the Command Master Chief. He is my senior enlisted advisor for the 2,800 enlisted sailors that are on board the George H.W. Bush. Uh, next to him is CS1 Dahlia Brooks. <laughs> she is a plank owner. That means she was on board before the ship was commissioned. She's uh, approaching four years of service on the Bush, so she's seen it come from uh, the beginning in the shipyards to an actual combat deployment under her belt. And next to her is uh, Petty Officer Sarah Strong. <laughs> and she got to the ship uh, a couple years ago. Uh, she just made a Petty Officer, which is the junior supervisory rank uh, for the Navy. All of these uh, were involved in either significant milestones on board the ship or they were actively involved in our community relations program or some other service project. But uh, for the questions, uh, at the end of the brief, I'd, I'd invite you to, to pose because I have covered the gamut of life on board uh, the carrier with the people that we have on board the ship. Okay, some background on the carrier. It was christened uh, October 7th, 2006. It was commissioned on January uh, 10th, 2009. And, uh, so as I was looking at the picture, I said, for people who are not familiar with a carrier, how to convey the size, the scale of a ship. What, what is that? And you can see all the people um, there. So it's 1,090 feet uh, long. If you stand it on its stern, it's as tall as the Empire State Building. So what is in an in a aircraft carrier? Well, as I mentioned, there's two reactors, uh, four catapults and four wires, and that's the airport. There's 500 tons of aluminum used in the construction of the ship. There's 1,400 telephones. Uh, to support that is over 1,600 miles of wires and cables. There's 1,600 tons of ordnance. That means there's over 3 million pounds of explosives on board the ship. 
There's uh, 3,000 sailors just assigned to me. When the staffs and the air wing is embarked, we approach 5,000. 18,000 meals are served daily. We have food for 90 days when we go underway for deployment. 30,000 light fixtures. There's over 250 miles of cabling associated with that. 47,000 tons of steel. 1,300,000 feet of piping, which means you could lay all the pipes used in the ship. It would take you from here to Dallas-Fort Worth and halfway back again. 3 million gallons of jet fuel. And if you add all those numbers up, you get CVN 77. It's a city at sea. So when you think of it, the United States Navy has 11 of these. This is the 10th Nimitz-class carrier, and we deploy routinely carriers out of Japan, the West Coast, and the East Coast every day, and they take this city at sea. And if you think of anything in a city, we have it on that ship. We have our own post office. We have police, paramedics, fire, our own TV station. We have a Main Street chapel, the hospital that the SMO runs, even a Starbucks on the corner. And, <laughs> and we go through about 1,000 cups of Starbucks a day. Okay, so as I mentioned, we were commissioned in January 2009. Uh, there was uh, about 18 months of shakedown cruises, certification, and accreditations to get us up to Navy standard in order to begin our workups. Workups began in earnest in the latter part of 2010. They finished up in February of 2011. We took a little break, uh, did one at sea period for carrier qualifications, and then we uh, got ready to deploy in May of 2011 in, in support of uh, the maritime strategy in the 6th Fleet, the C-6F is Commander 6th Fleet, and uh, that is the Mediterranean operating area, and 5th Fleet, F-5F, and that is in the vicinity of the Arabian Gulf, uh, the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea, that area there. Uh, for those, the maritime strategy, just to briefly, what, uh, another way to look at what is our job, uh, forward presence, where we go, who we see, who we bring aboard our ships, where we go for port calls, sends a message. Uh, it's either a reassurance of our allies or a, and a, a specific sign of commitment to our coalition partners because it is an investment and a commitment to put a carrier into any one port. And so we are always forward presence. We carry 64 fifth generation combat fighters on board, which is greater uh, more fighters than some countries' air force. So when we come, just our mere presence calms the situation. Uh, sea control. Uh, as you saw in the beginning, we're a maritime nation, as the Constitution says, provide and maintain for a Navy. Uh, there's a pattern of treaties that keep the global sea commons open, and the Navy is the one that enforces that. Power projection, uh, when we did deploy, we went off the coast of Pakistan, and we supported troops in Afghanistan, and we went into the Arabian Gulf, where we supported troops in Operation New Dawn in Iraq. Maritime security. Uh, with our forward presence is working with coalition partners, and we worked with uh, what's called coalition task forces in the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden for anti-piracy, off the coast of Africa, Somalia for anti-piracy, and then up in the Arabian Gulf where we worked for um, keeping the oil platforms and the oil running there. And we did not have to fortunately provide any humanitarian assistance disaster response, but on the west coast, the Ronald Reagan departed uh, for deployment before us, and if you may recall, uh, she went and assisted Japan after the earthquake-driven tsunamis that devastated their coast, and so the Ronald Reagan was there uh, to take care of that. So those are the skill sets that a carrier possesses when we go on deployment. Okay, just to give you uh, a picture, uh, this is uh, how we work deployment. So uh, we are based out of Norfolk, so at 545, uh, on the morning of May 11th, we got underway and we beat the sun. And so we were kind enough when a ship gets underway, it blows one long prolonged blast on its horn to let all the other ships around know that you're departing. We kept it extra long because we were loud and proud that this was our first deployment. And we figured seven months from now, nobody would remember we woke them up that early in the morning. Uh, so it was a beautiful day. Uh, the sun was shining and uh, we sailed east and uh, greeted it. And as we proceeded outbound, uh, I addressed the crew. Uh, we had a wave file, a sound file, uh, from our namesake, President Bush. And I used that to set the tone. So I addressed the crew. Um, the Admiral addressed the crew. 
and then the made into uh, then I uh, did the president's comments and if I could just read for a moment uh, he said to the crew the maiden deployment is the first chapter of the operational history of this ship you're trained and ready to serve your nation and your Navy I know you'll do well you'll be in my thoughts and prayers Tavu ceiling and visibility unlimited uh, with that we turned east to open up sea space so we could catch the air wing for their carrier qualification I played let's get it started by black eyed peas and away we went for the deployment. So we spent the next three days off the coast of Virginia uh, doing a carrier qualification and getting the air wing ready for deployment. And then we proceeded to sail 3,700 miles across the Atlantic uh, off the coast of England where we participated in Saxon Warrior, Operation Saxon Warrior. And that was a NATO-based exercise with 17 other countries. And we did undersea warfare, uh, we did surface action group, we did surface warfare in the air wing uh, launched and did air exercises, air combat, and bombing runs, slow levels into England in conjunction with their forces, where sometimes we'd play the bad guys, sometimes they'd play the bad guys as you do a post strikes. After that, we gave ourselves um, a richly deserved uh, port call because we had been gone for 16 whole days and uh, made our way into uh, Portsmouth, England. Uh, one thing on our forward presence to mention uh, is we were, a, as the newest Nimitz-class carrier, we had a strongly scheduled, robust Distinguished Visitor or DV program. Everywhere we went, we were spending time, and our cruise was actually extended to seven months so that we could have time to do all these engagements. So the first uh, uh, DV engagement series was there in England, and they are building two new carriers, and they're trying to reconstitute the carrier capability for the Royal Navy, and so they were coming on board uh, to see how we do business so they could reconstitute it, regenerate it for themselves. And so we had personal staff from the Prime Minister, we had Ministers of Parliament, we had their Secretary of Defense, we had uh, the equivalent of their House Armed Services Committee, we had members from their Treasury, um, uh, we had people that were conducting studies and surveys, we had Air Force saying that all the jets flown off the carrier should be Air Force, we had Navy saying all the jets should be Navy. And in the end, they took all that to go back um, to take into their strategic decision making uh, to see what they were going to do for the Queen Elizabeth and the um, Prince of Wales, which are their two carriers. And they are strong partners with our Joint Strike Fighter program. And so um, they are trying to make up their mind if they want to go with the Stovall version or the uh, regular conventional carrier. Um, so on that, we had 86 uh, distinguished visitors on board the ship. We toured over 850. Uh, we had a reception uh, where we had three ministers of parliament that came down for that, uh, 300 on that, and then we had two media engagements. So uh, the robust DV program started out strong in England. Uh, afterwards, we went uh, and flew again to always keep our, the air wings uh, edge sharp, and then we went through the Strog, which is the Straits of Gibraltar. Uh, part of our coalition, that is a Spanish frigate, the Admirante Juan de Bobon, and uh, that Spanish ship spent its entire... Uh, deployment, if you will, working up with us to further enhance their skills and bring that training that they received with the United States Navy back to their fleet. And there we train them and they're there we train the trainer so they could go and bring the Spanish Navy up to par with what we do in our operations. So we gave uh, the Bourbon the lead and the Bourbon was the escort ship and took us through uh, the Straits of Gibraltar. Of course, we couldn't go too long without a port call, so we had to go immediately into Cartagena, Spain, uh, where we had engagements with the Spanish Navy. The Secretary of the Navy came, the Ambassador to Spain came, and uh, many others. Uh, so we had a, uh, an opportunity for liberty there and uh, another reception and more guests toured the ship. Uh, we left there, took a day off to fly the air wing, and rolled into Naples for yet our third and final port call in the med for this. It was exhausting, I can tell you. It sounds like it was a good time, but it was truly exhausting. We basically steamed for one day, flew the air wing, and got in in the morning of the 11th and had a reception that night. And there uh, we, ho we were hosting the senior four-star admiral, chief of naval forces Europe, and so, and all of the Italians that were associated there. And again, the ambassador to Italy came out to the ship on one of those uh, uh, the day prior so he could invite his friends to that. So there we had pretty much gone through uh, our NATO side, engaged with all the people that we could in that the first three weeks of the deployment. We headed towards the Suez Canal, 
Uh, there's a little range there, a little island that we used, and so the airwing took uh, that time to hone their combat skills. They bombed, they strafed, uh, they got ready to go into combat, and then we proceeded into the Suez Canal and began our Suez Canal transit. Uh, the air wing flew off into Jordan, again for coalition building, and they did an air exercise with the Jordanian Air Force while we were going through there. Uh, at that point, uh, we proceeded down, and so this, as I mentioned, the coalition task force, we, um, Admiral Nozal, as a strike group commander, I am but one component of his strike group. I'm his flagship, he's embarked on me, but he also has a destroyer squadron with multiple destroyers assigned to him. The air wing is his, they embarked on the carrier, there's eight squadrons there. Um, and so the destroyers, while we were here, uh, we call it uh, disaggregating. And so peace parts of the strike group began to go and start working with our coalition partners. So here is CTF-150, here is Coalition Task Force 151, and here is 152. And this is where we did uh, struggle against violent extremists, anti-piracy was conducted in there. This is where we operated for Enduring Freedom. This is where we operated for Operation New Dawn. So we, would ca we came down here and we relieved the uh, Bataan Amphibious Ready Group who was uh, flying Harriers and they were supporting the Global War on Terror there. We allowed them a port call where they could refit, refuel and resupply. And then when they were done with that, they came back, we turned this, that, those duties all over to them. And then we proceeded up through and conducted the first of our six Straits of Hormuz transits, which you uh, probably have heard a little bit in the news uh, recently. And so we did six of them, five during the day, one at night. Um, and uh, we proceeded to go directly up to support Operation New Dawn in the Northern Arabian Gulf. Uh, that was the period where the Army would, was withdrawing their troops. Uh, the John C. Stennis relieved us and they uh, conducted the last flight op uh, for New Dawn in the month of December. Uh, so we did about 800 sorties there for 10 days, and then we went into Bahrain for our first port call. After Bahrain, we went out and started the routine cycle of flight ops in the 5th Fleet, and that's basically six weeks out at sea, and then one week to transit to a port call, and then transit back out to our operating where we're going. Uh, for those six weeks, you fly for six days, 12 to 14 hours, uh, and then you get one day for us to do a replenishment at sea where we would um, get about a million pounds of fuel through uh, three hoses that uh, our first lieutenant Hanks guys would get over and then on the deck side, the air boss would oversee about 400 pallets of food, fresh fruit and vegetables, supply parts and stuff for the store, uh, coffee, Starbucks cups, that kind of stuff, the, the vitals. Um, uh, and then uh, after that, uh, we would go back out again uh, after that uh, and then work in Enduring Freedom. Just some pictures here. Uh, this is our overall. We spent about 156 days total in the 5th Fleet AOR doing uh, OEF and OND. We had the three port visits. Uh, we did the six transits and uh, no fewer than 42 days. Uh, while we're out there, it's not uh, you know all work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. There are some times where you need to, uh, to quote Covey Sharp in the saw. So we took a couple times to take a steel beach picnic, and that's just a day for the crew to relax. On one of those days, we decided to do a swim call. And there's Command Master Chief Colton uh, jumping off in an un unauthorized form. Uh, typically, <laughs> when, you, when you jump off, you're supposed to, and if you look right to his right, is somebody, a, a very fervent packer backer using the correct form. Uh, that would be me. Uh, then, so as you jump off, it's 30 feet from the elevator down into the water. If you're not holding your nose, you could get a sonic uh, uh, blast into your sinuses. That's what I did the first time I did it, so I'm always very sure to cover my nose now. But uh, we uh, had about uh, 1,500 sailors take this opportunity to jump off the ship and swim around to the fantail. Uh, no sea life. The ship puts out so much noise in the water, it pretty much scares all the sea life away. It was a beautiful day. Uh, seas were calm, we ordered it special, and so everybody got to jump off. Once everybody got the first time to do it, we opened it up for a little bit uh, for people who wanted to do it again. We had a few that did that, and then uh, we shut down the swim call and then brought everybody up to the flight deck, and we had a picnic, a Seal Beach picnic down there. So it was a good day, uh, a little bit relaxing, allowed everybody to recharge their batteries. Okay. Uh, so after we did our two um, Operation Enduring Freedom uh, line periods, we're calling us, we uh, went into Dubai again for another port call. 
Uh, this we did a maiden voyage desert classic golf tournament. Again, we honed some of our skills. Um, if you notice, again, that uh, I'm on the winning team here uh, so we won uh, that golf tournament. Uh, we tried to have a golf tournament in every port that we went to. Again, just uh, we have a very robust morale, welfare, and recreation fund. And every port we went to, they went to do something different, something special. And so our sailors, 40% of the sailors, this was their first deployment. And for those sailors, they had the opportunity to get the continental, I call the trifecta, of London, Paris, and Rome as port calls. And when we went in there, you could do winery tours, you could do museum tours, you could hop on, and our more MWR would set up all these. And all you do is buy a ticket and show up, and they, we would bus you or train you to see see the world. And when I came in the Navy, that was, uh, we're a global force for good now, but for me it was to see the world, to come in the Navy and have an adventure. Again, we had uh, another Steel Beach picnic out of Houston. You have the steak mission. And so we got a phone call from them, and they said, hey, we'd like to uh, come out and cook your sailors some steaks. And so some fine Texas beef made its way to Bahrain. All the fixing corn, jalapeno cornbread, um, some appetizers that they had, and then they brought it all on a ship with volunteers, and they cooked the whole meal for the crew. Brought it all, cooked it all, and we cleaned up, and then away we went. So that was fun. And then uh, I had asked for a concert for the crew, um, again, to keep them uh, sharp, give them an opportunity to recharge. So I don't know if anyone's familiar. There's a few uh, country western bands had some moderate success, Little Texas, uh, Lone Star and Restless Heart. I don't know if anyone's familiar with those bands. The front men for those three bands came and sang. So uh, that's Tim Rushlow. Uh, he did, uh, he was Little Texas, Richie McDonald from Lone Star and Larry Gatlow from Restless Heart. So they put on a show for the crew in the hangar bay, uh, which was pretty outstanding. And the neatest part was at the end of it, uh, they said, hey, we'll take a couple minutes to sign any autographs for anyone and a line of hundreds of sailors uh, formed, and they brought T-shirts and books and guitars, and those three uh, gentlemen stayed the entire time until every sailor had gotten something signed. They were truly great Americans and supported the troop in an outstanding fashion. So we um, had those opportunities, and that took us our last line period, where again we flew uh, for 28 days, did about 2,400 sorties, flew for about 4,800 mile, uh, 4,800 hours, and that closed the book on the operational aspect of the ship. So we had gone there and supported Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, we had supported Operation New Dawn. And then that ended uh, that portion of the deployment. And then began the long transit home. And so we finished uh, at night and uh, here, and we just commu commenced to return to home port. And uh, we did our final Straits of Hormuz transit at night. And uh, it's r rather a benign uh, transit to go through the Straits of Hormuz. It's uh, what we call, it, this is called the knuckle. And it's basically a 30-mile leg, a 16-mile knuckle, and a 30-mile leg. And as you go through the Straits of Hormuz, the Iranians want to know who you are, what ship you are, because they track everybody in the traffic separation scheme. They're on the north side. The Omanis are on the south side. And so they want to track everybody who's going through the Straits of Hormuz, mostly because you sail through Omani territorial water as you go through there. So we would always go through with at least one other ship. And so as we would go through, uh, typically the, somebody would ask us who we were, we'd repeat, and then the Iranians would ask us frequently, who are you? And then we wouldn't have to answer after the first one because we already said who we were and identified. And eventually the Omanis and the Iranians would start arguing on who was talking on the radio more, and then finally tell each other, shut up, and then we just would continue on through the Straits of Hormuz. So... <laughs> I found the, mo the most arduous part of the whole trip was writing down what everybody said so we could reconstitute if anything did happen, who said what to who first. So it was very paperwork intensive transit. Uh, as we proceeded down, we just went all the way through. There was no uh, additional, the weather was bad, so the piracy events uh, during our time precluded extensive operations for the pilots, uh, the pirates. They typically go off in the mothership and have the smaller boats that go out after the bigger boats, but since the smaller boats couldn't safely sail, they spent a good bit of their time on the beach uh, waiting for the, the weather to, the season to change so they could go back out to sea again. And then we just proceeded back up through the Suez Canal. And again, we had a very robust uh, distinguished visitor program for the Egyptians. Um, they had about 35 people on for the last trip through the Suez Canal. 
they enjoyed it so much they didn't want to leave. Unfortunately, when you're in the Suez Canal, you can't stop. And so as we approached the Port Said Authority where they were supposed to get off, we kept saying to them, there's six other ships behind us, you need to get on your small boat, but they hadn't called the small boat. So it was quite a bit of excitement there for a short period of time as we proceeded to get as slow as everybody could to give them an opportunity to get off because if they didn't get off, they were going to be riding us into the Mediterranean. So at some point they realized the impending sailing into the Mediterranean and they moved with a vigor to get off the ship. And then once we got into the Mediterranean again, uh, the Distinguished Visitor Ops started. And uh, this time uh, we had a bunch of folks from uh, Macedonia and Greece come on board. Um, the Georgians in particular had a, a good number of people that came on board. Uh, very um, favorably inclined to the United States after we sent Navy ships in there with their little dust up with the Russians uh, that had occurred. So they came on board. We had uh, embassy from the Vatican uh, joined us, and then the ambassador from Spain rejoined us again. Uh, he liked it so much the last time he was there. We did some operations off the coast of Sardinia, and then we went into our final port call, which was Marseille, France. And that's where the crew got their opportunity to go to Paris, um, which is a pretty good deal, just a high-speed rail line, a uh, couple hours, and away you go. So we were there for a weekend. Um, my wife decided it was time for her to have a weekend in Paris, so she came over as well. So it was a good time had by all. Uh, that was around Thanksgiving. Everybody started getting uh, excited to be coming home, and this was pretty much all downhill from here as we uh, came back home. Uh, our last DV operation uh, involved, again, the, the Commander of Naval Forces Europe, the CNO of the Royal Netherlands Navy, and uh, the Dutch Navy, a couple others, and... Uh, and then we proceeded through the Straits of Gibraltar again, again at night. That is the Rock of Gibraltar uh, for people interested. And then we made it into the Atlantic in the month of December. Again, we were fortunate. Um, the weather was fantastic. Uh, as you may know, recall, we took the northern in the summertime to go across, but in the winter, to avoid the storms, we took the southern leg. Uh, seas were calm. For us, we rode behind a, a storm that was coming. And we proceeded into one day of flying by Bermuda to get the airplanes ready for flyoff. A day out of Mayport, we flew all the airplanes off, and so the squadrons got um, their opportunity to go see their families uh, for their homecoming. And then we pulled into Mayport, Florida, and we used that as an opportunity to pick up Tigers. And so what we do at the end of a deployment typically is we offer the ship to friends and family so they can come on board and they can see what their sons and daughters, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives have been doing for the last seven months. And so they can see where they slip, slept, where they ate, what they did. Um, we had flight ops so they could see flight ops on a carrier. The destroyer squadron did a sea power demonstration so they could see the ships. And so it is generally well received by all. Um, we invited friends of uh, our namesake, friends of 41, and uh, just to show what a small world it is, so uh, we had friends from Texas and friends from Maine. Uh, the battle group commander, Nora Tyson, had actually gone to the same high school as Dana. And uh, Judy, who's there in the audience, had actually chased me around Daniels Farm Elementary School in Trumbull, Connecticut. And as we were talking, and uh, uh, we realized that, hey, yes, you look familiar, that we both grew up in the same town and gone to the same elementary school. So a small world from Connecticut all the way to Mayport, Florida, via Houston, Texas, we uh, met up again. Hi, Judy, how you doing? All right, so from there, we proceeded up and then did our return to home port on December 10th, which again, uh, we lucked out. The weather was fantastic, and uh, the pier was full of uh, families and friends waiting for us to come back. And so a cheerful, happy day, and, uh, and that concluded the deployment. So I mentioned uh, I addressed the crew um, on the day we left for deployment. And so our namesake had given us a challenge of writing the first chapter of our operational history. And so I had to figure out how was I to convey that vision to my sailors. And so I took the opportunity, I had an anecdote, and I used this throughout the deployment because for sailors, the first time, 100 times you tell them it doesn't count. So there has to be a certain refresh rate to it. But I said, um, the anecdote I used was, a man walks onto a construction site and he sees three men working. 
And he goes to the first man. He says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm laying bricks. And then he goes to the second man. And he said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a wall. And then he went to the third man. And he said, what are you doing? And he stood up and he spread his arms. And he said, I'm building a cathedral. And so my challenge to the crew on that, the first day of deployment, is some of you are here for this tour. Just finished the deployment. Some of you are to figure out your enlistment. And I said, but what I ask you all to do on this, the first deployment, is to build the cathedral. Because every sailor that comes to this ship will ask, how do you do it on board USS George H.W. Bush? And how we do it is written on this, our first deployment. So we want to create a culture of excellence on the ship. And I said, it's okay for us not to win an award but it's not okay for us to not win an award because we didn't know what was involved in it. And so I set high, high goals for every department, every member of the crew. And I said, don't get mad at me because I set high goals. Get mad at me if I set low goals and you achieve them because I will have just trained you to settle. So there was some resistance. And again, I said, don't get upset because something is rarely done. Don't confuse rarely done with impossible to do. And the crew took all of those on board. And in the end, what kind of chapter did we write for operational excellence? Uh, this crew, these sailors and the officers that you see in front of you, won every departmental excellence award available to them. It's the only operational carrier to do so. They won. They were selected as the Airland Battle E winner. That's the Operational Excellence Award for the East Coast. They won the um, Fleet Forces Retention Excellence Award for the fourth consecutive year. For our advancement cycle, led by the Master Chief, we set the standard for the last five years, the highest advancement rate for any carrier in the United States Navy. Our flight ops were higher than the last five carriers. We had no significant mishaps associated with any of those flight ops. Uh, for the last five carriers. Uh, when we went through the SMO, her medical readiness is higher than any other ship in the fleet, any other carrier in the fleet. Derek's reactor department did the first East Coast no notice uh, operational reactor safeguard examination and excelled on that. The Air Boss set records, as I said, for flight operations. Lieutenant Commander Finch took us in. Uh, our ship looked so good. Uh, we got comments from other carrier COs asking us what our secret was for the ship coming back from a seven-month deployment looking so well. And so throughout our deployment, we did various community relations, and we set the new bar for carriers and doing community relations in the Fifth Fleet area of responsibility. So in the end, departmentally, we did fantastic, and we also found out in the reactor department, we, we were the watch officer of the year selectee. Our enlisted was the enlisted engineer of the year. And for operations department, we found out just today that our air traffic controller submission was selected as the air traffic controller of the year. So <laughs> so we set the bar high uh, in order to answer the challenge made by our namesake. And I think we have written quite the chapter for the first operational deployment of our carrier. And so... Um, in his inaugural speech, uh, the president said, uh, we know what's right, freedom is right, we know what works, freedom works, and we've taken that as our motto. And I see now that my time is up, so I thank you for listening to my presentation of Freedom at Work's first deployment, and I would now offer up my crew for any questions that those in the audience may have. Thank you. Captain, thank you very much for that very wonderful presentation. As the captain said, he's ready to take some questions along with his crew. Those of you who have any questions, please feel free to step forward now. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment on the, the uh, Iranians' capability to, uh, to block the Straits of Hormuz. I've been reading recently about some enhanced... Uh, 
I guess attack speed boats they had and ground, uh, I guess ground to ship and ship to ship missiles and, and their threats to, to block the straits or, you know, the alleged threats. And I just wonder how that's affected our, our capability to, to keep the straits open. Um, at an unclassified level, uh, I can't obviously go into too much detail. If, if I could just say that you know, I don't look at it, but I've been in the Navy for a couple decades now, and I have been through the majority of my time going through the Straits of Hormuz. And uh, a as I said, it's a fairly routine evolution. And um, we have capabilities, and they have capabilities. Both are well known. And, um, and both have planned on how they would uh, s secure the Straits. Our goal is to keep it open, to allow for free transit of ships and commerce through. Their goal is to hold it hostage. In the end, uh, they, I think, would be hurt more by securing the Straits of Hormuz than we would be for, for oil production. But um, there is nothing that they have that is all that new uh, associated with what you're saying that we haven't been planning for. When I was on the Nimitz in 2006, when I was on the Taro in 2007, when I was on the George H.W. Bush in 2011. So it is something that the Fifth Fleet commander is aware of that we plan to and train to. So uh, right now I would say it's a certain amount of posturing on their part and you know if they develop something, we'll come up with a counter. Yes, sir. A multi-part question for the senior medical officer. What is your specialty and where did you go to school and do your residency? Um, I uh, am a family medicine doctor. I'm also aerospace medicine, which is one of the preventive medicine fields. I went to Florida State for undergrad, Florida for med school, got my master's degree in public health from Tulane. I did my residency in the Navy at the Naval Hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, so you did your residency with the Navy. Did you ever imagine when you were, were working on your undergraduate in medical school that you would be responsible for the medical facilities for what amounts to a decent sized town? Uh, no, sir. I actually uh, did that when I was turning over with my predecessor back in March of last year. I, we were standing there doing a mass casualty drill on the flight deck and as we're standing on one of the aircraft elevators as it's lowering about 30 simulated casualties down to the hangar bay, I looked at him and I was like, how did I get here? Um, it's uh, one of those things that you just look at, and I, I did that several days on deployment where we would be uh, running on the flight deck, so I'd go up, you know, get some exercise out in the sun, and uh, just look around and uh, wonder how you got there, and it, it really was just an opportunity. Um, in med school, the um, recruiter showed up to med school and said, hey, I've got a deal for you. I'll pay for med school if you give us a couple of years, and I said, well, that sounds good, and uh, did that, and uh, I've paid back that uh, obligation several times over. They trained me to be a family medicine doctor and said, you owe us a couple more years. I paid that back. They gave me a master's degree. I'm paying that back now. So uh, they just keep giving me uh, great benefits and I'll uh, just keep doing it till they kick me out again. Yes, sir, we have a question. <laughs> Howdy, I'm Officer Candidate Riley with the Navy ROTC here. Uh, my question is for Master Chief. Uh, with your vast experience in the amount of ships that you've been on, uh, how does the George Bush compare living space-wise, uh, especially with the other new ships in the fleet, the Green Bay, the LCSs, and things of that nature? Well, um, I served on a minesweeper and uh, a carrier, and I will tell you that the carrier has vast improvements over a minesweeper. <laughs> <laughs> well, then to uh, any of the crew uh, in comparison to previous ships. I served on a ship that was uh, commissioned in 1941, so I would tell you <laughs> <laughs> technology is a big deal, and then it's vast. So not that he was in the navy. In <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's quite impressive, to be honest with you. It, it truly is. It's it's leading edge. I have a Starbucks. Uh, my sailors drink Starbucks coffee, not because we don't offer anything else, but because they elect to. Uh, they have internet capability. We've just found a way to offer Facebook. So there, it, it's hard. You're leaving your family for seven months, eight months, but we're doing everything we can to improve their quality of life. 
Do we have any questions from that side? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, sir, go ahead. Yeah, what improvements have been made to the original Nimitz design? In class? Uh, so that's an interesting question. I was the XO on the Nimitz, which is the first, and then the commanding officer of the George H.W. Bush, which is the last. So I refer to myself as the Alpha and Omega captain. Um, uh, making it a little more difficult to do an uh, apples to apples comparison is we're a transition technology ship for the Ford, which will be the next carrier that comes out, and it's the first of its class. And I think what you find if you went from the earlier Nimitz classes to the George H.W. Bush is there have been a number of thoughtful design changes that increase our operational efficiency. And I think primary of those is there's a slight angle and cant to the flight deck, which uh, we have four, as I mentioned them before, four catapults, uh, three wires that we use, one spare. Uh, with that slight change, you can launch off of both bow cats, Cat 1 and Cat 2, while you're um, recovering airplanes in the landing area. Other ships earlier, you could only use Cat 1, and if you use Cat 2, it would follow the landing area. So that uh, gets us a marginal increase in efficiency, but over time, it grows. It's a significant improvement. And um, there's other changes that have been done, either an electrical distribution system, or the redesign of the island, moving uh, elevators that take ordnance from the magazines down below decks and bring it up to the flight deck and keep that ordnance sheltered. Not that when it's put on an airplane, it's not exposed to the elements, but uh, when you bring it up and down, it's just easier to do that when it's in a covered space and working. And, a, and there are all more advanced technology-wise, uh, the fusing and stuff from what uh, bombs were 30 years ago. So. Uh, for the George H.W. Bush, we have uh, operating efficiencies built in throughout the ship. If you go to the older ships, after multiple yard periods, the quality of life additions are there because there's nothing more impressive than the ingenuity of a sailor and how to improve their own quality of life. And so one thing, for example, on the Nimitz is they've hung an extra space in the hangar bay and created a gym there. It's a mezzanine running area, and I think there's 20 treadmills in that one space, but you can't find a spot on our ship right now where you can find 20 treadmills co-located, which uh, made running the Marine Corps Marathon, which we did quite a trick uh, uh, this past October. So we had people strewn all about the ship uh, running on any treadmill that was available. So the quality of life is, I would say, better on the older ships because there's been more time to, to instill those changes. But operationally, I think you'll find that the, the newer carriers have some improvements that make them more efficient. Good. We have a young man here from the Scouts. Go ahead, sir. What's it like living on a battleship? Ooh. <laughs> I, I would have to defer to my surface warfare officer <laughs> as, as I'm uh, living on an aircraft carrier. Um, well, I, you know, uh, not to monopolize, but we can... Um, the quality of life is different uh, by your pay grade. I'm kind of an unfair person to ask because... <laughs> I have some pretty nice digs on the aircraft carrier. So I have my own import cabin, uh, which we use as a presentation space. And I have my own cabin at sea behind the bridge. So if there's ever any emergency, I can run out quickly. But when you're junior, you start out in barracks um, with more people living in it. So I don't know if Petty Officer Brooks or Strong, if you want to yeah. chip in there. The carrier life, we have the burden area where we sleep. Um, we go to work regular from 7 to 7 or so. Um, after work, we usually hit the gym, or we stay on the, the mass deck, the eating area, study, do whatever you want after hours, or just go, go, you have a church you could go to, also if you're into that. Very strong, anything? Nothing to add. <laughs> Let's go we'll to get the, her yet. Let's go to this gentleman over here. Captain Mike Davis, uh, U.S. Army. Um, I'm a My veteran apologies. of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a veteran, a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom, and I just want to let you guys know we appreciate what you do. Well, and thank you for thank your you. service as well. <laughs> this young man? Uh, how many ships have you, all of you all been on? Uh, Ooh, how many battleships have you all How many been ships on? have we all been on? Uh, one. One. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Ara? I've been on seven, counting this one. Good. Let's go to that young man over there. Have you seen any pr pirates whenever you were uh, 
on any of the ships? Yes, uh, I have. I don't know if RO had any, no, um, but uh, that's part of what we do uh, while we're on deployment. Typically, they stay away from an aircraft carrier. My previous ship was the USS Tarawa, and we actually tracked a French sailboat that had been uh, captured by pirates. It had a very, very tall mast, so we were actually able to secure all of our radars and then use the curvature of the earth and track them by the height of their sail and then uh, just track them and provide cueing information to the French because the French said that they would take this particular issue for action and so we maintained contact until the French arrived and they took care of business. Mark, you want to help the young man? Um, what, what, kind of, well, what kind of pirate ships do you fight? <laughs> Detecting a theme. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, typically, the pirate ships um, are just small uh, boats with outboard motors, and uh, it's not like um, the Black Pearl that comes up <laughs> alongside. Uh, and so uh, you just uh, have these little small boats that swarm a bigger boat. Okay. Sir, you have a question? Appreciate you talking about freedom relative to your mission. But your namesake was in war. Can you talk about uh, what the operations on 77 would be like under a wartime situation? We, um, in our workups, we trained through uh, various different scenarios uh, that we could go through. And whether it be um, through a mine channel, a sweat mine channel, so we're trained to drive the ship through a very narrow body of water. Uh, we go through various, uh, using the air wing, the air wing is the main battery of an aircraft carrier, and so we can do sustained operations for one day, two day, three days, and we support the air wing in whatever mission is assigned to them. And so that could be strikes over land, it could be strikes as it was in uh, OEF in Afghanistan and supported troops on the ground. There that combat operations is dictated by the ground combat commander, and so he will provide a requirement for air cover to the air combat commander who will then levy that requirement across the force, whether that be Air Force airplanes, Marine airplanes, or uh, airplanes that are coming off the carrier. And so we will do that you know, for a fly day, which would be 12 hours typically on deployment. And the crews would be briefed, and then they would fly off the ship, go to a tanker to top off the gas, and then they would, they would take uh, station. Um, and there they would be under tasking, and if a troop found itself in contact, they would be called down, and they could provide a show of force or a show of presence. And then they would go back uh, to the tanker and top off again, typically, then go back over, provide some coverage to the tanker, and then come back. Operations in Afghanistan are somewhat different because it's like flying out of the Gulf of Mexico and executing a mission over Chicago. So a good bit of the flight time of the day is spent transiting from the carrier to a station and coming back again. The Admiral Nozal was a air wing commander um, for his operational tour. Admiral, would you like to add anything in particular? Okay, just, just to ensure my veracity there. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're starting to run out of time, so we have a number of questioners lined up. I ask that no one else join the line. We'll try to go through the ones that are lined up right now. Mark. What kind of uh, meals do you have on ship? Um, well, CS1, you want to, CS stands oh, for culinary meals? specialist. Oh, <laughs> um, everything you, you could think of. We have a lot of ice cream on board. <laughs> <laughs> the young ones. Um, mashed potatoes, chips, taco bar, all kind of food. Chicken. We even had, um, one day we had um, Caribbean night. You know, we do all kind of meals for them. But by far. The, the ship's favorite night was Friday night because that was pizza and wings. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ma'am? Howdy. Thank you all for your service. Um, I'm a graduate student here at the Bush School of Government uh, studying international affairs, and I had a question about flight operations. Um, how often do the planes on the ship have to fly sorties to stay mission ready? And what's the schedule like? Go ahead, Bob. Um, it, it'll depend. What we operate off is called an airplane. Uh, called a, it's a flight schedule for, for all the different squadrons throughout the day. And as Captain alluded to that, our flight uh, window was normally about 12 to 14 hours a day. And those are divided up into periods of time. Nominally an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half. So you have about nine or 10 cycles throughout the day. 
our, our normal uh, flight ops would consist of launching anywhere from about 10 to 15 airplanes, and then we'd catch about that uh, represent, representative number. The airplanes we would just would recover, they have about an hour and a half to get refueled, rearmed, get the new pilots in them, get the deck respotted the way we needed to, and then we get, continue to do that throughout the day. So it's kind of repetitive nature. Uh, but again, it all kind of goes back to the air, co air component commander uh, and what w the mission that we're supporting. If it's a training type scenario, then we kind of can drive that plane and we can uh, adjust the number of airplanes and sorties that are flying. If we're supporting combat operations, then it's a little more dictated to us of what we need to do. Uh, one of the other things we need to do is we need to supply our own tanker aircraft. In case airplanes can't land aboard the ship, then they'll go up, they'll uh, get some more airborne gas, and then come back down and try to do that again. So hopefully that answered your question. It, it's operated off a, a schedule of what we do each and every day. You're welcome. Mike. Have one of your ships ever sank? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Ma'am. Thank you for your service. I'd like to hear from some of the crew, which I very much appreciate your bringing. What was something that was unexpected or surprising for you on this deployment is the first question. The second is, I can only imagine the amount of trash that 3,000 people create. And so I'm very curious about what happens to it all. Well, while they're pausing to think of what surprised mm -hmm. them, which if I did my job right, there shouldn't have been any. Um, <laughs> on our, uh, we're actually very environmentally conscious, so we don't throw any plastic over the side. All, we take all of the um, food that we can pulp up uh, and uh, put into the water uh, that's biodegradable, that goes in. If there's metal trash, we have big compactors and we'll take all the metal and we'll take that and compact that separately. And then for any plastics, we have, um, uh, uh, we call it a puck maker, and we take all this plastic and it's melted and formed into big uh, hockey pucks the size of manhole covers, and then we put those in big cardboard triwalls, and then we take that and then we uh, take it off the ship, and then it's brought back to shore where it can be properly disposed of. So all of our, um, and then we have an incinerator too, uh, that burns at such a high temperature that if anything not supposed to be in there is burned in there, um, it's environmentally safe to be for that exhaust to go out. So we spend a lot of time going through and ensuring that, um, you know, do the Cub Scouts, we leave it better than we found it and leave no trace of our passing, if you will. So, uh, any, anyone surprised by anything on the deployment? Um, I was surprised by the Liberty calls. <laughs> We had a bunch of liberty calls, so it was really great. It's unusual to have that many port calls, especially in the beginning. Uh, I think that was the unique aspect of our first deployment. Where do you get all your food and drinks from? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, different kinds of ships that we have, oilers and resuppliers. And so... Um, these logistics ships, if you will, will go into a port, and our supply officer is just writing down um, all the food is done off a 14-day meal plan, and so there's some flexibility in there, so it's got beef, chicken, pork, all the fixings. And so whenever we go into a local area, you take advantage of the local produce and fresh fruit and vegetables that you can get there. And so every week on that seventh day, um, a ship would come to the left and a ship would come to the right and we would get cargo from the ship uh, on the left vertically replenished. So the helos would come in, and they would bring hundreds of pallets of food and whatever we had ordered. And then typically we would put the plastic and trash on the ship to the right because we could fly four rigs, we'd call it, maybe five, and then uh, depending on how Froggy first was feeling. And uh, we could bring three hoses over that would take the jet fuel over, and then, um, then we would have two wires that we could take uh, conventional stuff over just in um, pallets again through the, the, the con rep. And so that's typically how we would do it. So every week we would get food from the local uh, merchants. Last question. How many anti-aircraft guns do you have? Sadly, I don't have any anti-aircraft guns. Um, if you look at pictures of a World War II carrier, uh, we are uh, mostly armed with missiles. We have some 50 cal machine guns um, throughout the ship, we have 10 mounts for that. But 
we have both the rolling airframe missile and the evolved NATO Sea Spur missiles for self-defense for airplanes. Okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our program for tonight. I'd like to thank the captain and the members of his crew for being with us here tonight. And I know I speak for everyone here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you.